Hi, my name is uh, but you probably know me as Chris, Chris from Speaker's Corner. I started evangelizing in Speaker's Corner about two years ago. Uh, my ministry is to predominantly Muslims, to call Muslims away from Muhammad and towards our Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't grow up in a religious household. I didn't grow up um, a Christian. I grew up as, a, as an agnostic, really. Um, my parents were agnostic or atheist or spiritual in some sense, but certainly not Christian. We didn't do, we didn't go to church, didn't do anything like that. But what did happen is I went to a Roman Catholic primary school. So there, although I wasn't in any sense Christian and neither was my parents, um, I got exposed to the gospel in, in kind of like a, a childish, naive sense. I didn't really know what the gospel was in its fullest. I knew Jesus was someone who loved me and died for me in my place to, to deal with my sin, but I didn't really know anything more than that. Later on, I went to a secondary school. This secondary school was secular. There was no religion that was favored. There was certainly no emphasis on Christianity being the true religion, which was quite, quite a, a contrast going from this religious school to this non-religious school and just seeing how different things were. The people that I was around certainly had no, no patience or no love for Christianity or for any religion for that matter. So like most teenagers, I followed my peers and their example. I ended up being with a group of friends that were kind of like the outcasts, really, of, of kind of the, the social groups. But we, in and of ourselves, were our own group. And I had a friend, I'm going to call him Jim. He had long, long blonde hair, you know, black shades, a black leather jacket. The guy did everything he could to look older than he was. He was only 13. We were all 13 at this point. He discovered he could get alcohol uh, and he could also get drugs. So he would go out and he would go to the corner shop or he'd go to his mate, whoever he knew. Um, and for most, and to begin with, it was, it was alcohol. So he would <laughs> buy uh, either some form of beers or alcohol pops, you know, like WKD, VM or whatever it was called. And, you know, we'd go into fields, cold fields in the middle of winter just sitting around getting drunk or go underneath a bridge somewhere and we would just drink and get absolutely wasted. And to begin with that kind of thing is, is fun, you know, it's, it's exciting, you, you know, you're only young, you're still a child, so going out, spending time with your friends, doing something interesting, seeing how everyone is affected by it is, is, is interesting, right? It's, um, it's fun. But as things sort of move forward, it, it kind of changed. Someone once said to me, do you know what binge drinking is? And I was like, well, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's when you have a problem with alcohol. You know, you're, you're an alcoholic, you, you probably go to AA. You can't just have a few drinks. You have to have all of the drinks, you know, you... And then the, the person added to that definition and they said, yeah, it's like, you spend Monday to Friday planning and preparing for what you're going to drink on Saturday. And I remember thinking, and they said, and you do that every week. And I thought, that is exactly what we do. That's exactly what I do every week. And I never thought of it that way. And I, and I, and I remember that time I, I was thinking, I'm binge drinking. Like I never, I mean, this, this is coming from a 13, 14 year old child. I, I never, I never thought of it that way. It, it was just easy to rationalize that that's not what I was doing. I was just doing a very innocent, you know, exploratory thing, you know, just going out and drinking with friends. But it wasn't really just that. We, we were always trying to um, hook up with girls, you know, there were, there were times when I couldn't stand properly. There were times when I couldn't stand uh, I would be just falling over, I couldn't walk properly, I couldn't speak, I would slur, I would just spout off nonsense. I, times when I completely forgot what on earth happened the night before and I had to have other uh, friends tell me what that was. And, you know, at the time you don't think much of it, but looking back at it you realise just how messed up that was. 
the more that I was doing this, the more I was being involved, um, organizing these events. And by events, I really do mean just going out into fields, um, going on bridges, going in just, you know, places where we wouldn't be found, we could have some privacy. And I think, I think it takes a little part out of, out of you. I remember once there was a, there was a girl that I liked, um, and I remember I was organizing this event, you know, it was going to be, I think I was about 14, 14, 15 at the time. And I organized this event, uh, it wasn't just me and my group, it was this group and this other group, and that group was where she was from, uh, and she had traveled quite a long way to come and see. Uh, I got so drunk that I, I just remember yelling, just, 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 just yelling just anything, being unable to stand, I had to have someone physically carry me, like just to lean on, to, to support me as I walked home. I couldn't speak properly. I was just, you know, running out into roads and, and just stuff that was just really dumb. And I think that was the first time I realized that what I was doing could be destructive. Like it could actually really mess up what you're trying to do in life. You can't really have relationships with people if the way that you genuinely go out and spend time with them is you're just plastered, um, drunk and, and just not, not really sociable. You know, you drink to be social, but then if you drink too much, you become something completely different. I remember one time, again, for the, the same reason, actually, it was to meet a girl, because Jim was with me. We were traveling uh, quite far away. We had to get a train. You know, we had got all the alcohol ready. Um, <laughs> you know, we had figured out how to smuggle that out of, of like family homes. We brought it with us on this train. Uh, and then after the train, we took a bus. It was quite far away and it was, it was basically a field. And we met there, there was this girl that I liked and I got so, so drunk, um, I completely passed out. And I remember waking up, and, and when I woke up, I woke up on a bus going back. And all I remember is just looking across, and, and my mate Jim was there. And he just looked at me and just gave me this look of, of disappointment because I had just completely zoned out. And it, it, just hadn't, it just hadn't been a good night for me. I started to struggle more with my role within my peer group. I was becoming more involved in, in setting up events, uh, organizing, you know, who's going to do what and when. And I didn't like what it did to me and what it did to my peers. There were others who, who I saw it do really bad things to. In my own life, I started to struggle with depression. I didn't like what I was doing, but didn't really have any means to get out of it. This was my group, this was my friend group, this is what I did, this is what I've been doing for many years at this point, and that's what I was gonna to continue to do. I think it was like 2007. I, or somewhere around there, there was a smoking ban that was introduced in pubs, in, in public places. And from then on out, you couldn't just go into a, a pub and just start smoking, you would have to you know, go out or go into a special non, uh, smoking allowed area, which was outside, right? Well, the day or a few days before that was introduced, I was sitting in a pub that me and Jim and a few others considered our local. Uh, we were 14, 15 years old at the time. And we celebrated in a sense that by just smoking as much as we could in that, in that last day uh, while drinking as well. Um, we used to go in there a lot. I have no idea how the owners of the place didn't think it was suspicious given that there is no way on earth I looked 18. Uh, but Jim did, and I'm not sure how, but you know, they always served us. We never had any issues. Um, we, we, were, we were friendly in a sense. We didn't, we didn't cause any issues for them. Uh, and I think to be honest, because we were kind of terrified. In my own life, I become quite isolated. I didn't really have much of a relationship with my parents uh, or my siblings. I struggled to 
to really kind of have any meaningful relationship with anyone at home. I remember deciding one day that I wanted to get out of the things that I was doing. I saw what it was doing to others. So I, I did what I could to try to get out. Uh, of that situation, I stopped answering calls. I stopped um, answering the door when people came around. I told people to go away, did everything I could, gave people the middle finger, quite literally. I, I, I did not want anything to do with uh, these the same group, but it was difficult. And it was difficult because I couldn't really explain to anyone why. Um, I just knew I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be a part of it. But depression still remained. I had these values that I think came from probably childhood when I was uh, at this, this Catholic school that I didn't really know what to do with because I couldn't, couldn't enact them the way that I wanted to. I couldn't be the person that I envisioned I would want to be. I had this idealistic view sort of as a, as a depressed child trying to figure out, okay, well, you know, if I was stronger, if I, if I had more will, and if I actually pushed myself and I asserted myself, I could get to this position where I wanted to be. I could do the things I wanted to do. But in reality, I think for most people, that's not, that's not an option. You're actually not able to, to actualize what you want to be. You, you are stuck with your upbringing. You are stuck with your environment. And you can't do anything about that. That is, that is what you, that is, it is the hand you are dealt with. My mom in particular, uh, very concerned about me, was feeling powerless to really help or to, to do anything. I wasn't talking to her, I wasn't talking to anyone. So she's put me in therapy. So uh, I had therapy for a few years. At this point, um, I cut myself off from pretty much everyone around me. I would just go to school, be alone. There, there were a few people that I, I had to, out of sort of necessity, have some sort of relationship with. But yeah, those close to me, I pushed away. I thought it was better that I, I wouldn't feel like joining them in what they were doing or helping them or in any way contributing to the kind of things they were planning. It eventually came to a point where I was self-harming. I didn't really see any reason to continue the next day. I, I used to have this thing where I'd wake up in the morning, I would just get ready, wouldn't talk to anyone, I would then walk to school. It was about a 45 minute walk. I wouldn't eat, I wouldn't drink, I would just have this bottle of Lucozade. That's, that's all I had, I would, I would go to the shop at break and I'd buy this bottle of Lucozade and I would drink that and then just do the rest of the day, walk 45 minutes home and then just collapse. I just collapse on the bed. I didn't have any energy left. Um, you know, I didn't eat uh, like dinner. I, I just re reject it. I wouldn't want to eat anything. And then I just wake up the next day and do it all over again. I didn't. I didn't really have much to motivate me to keep going. Uh, I remember I, I had this question that I just couldn't answer. I, I used to say to myself, I, I, I used to say like, like, why not just end this because. Where I was at that point in my life, I didn't really see any purpose in life. I didn't see any reason to keep continuing life. I wasn't able to be who I wanted to be. I wasn't strong enough to do that. And all my attempts, and I had spent many years at this point trying to come up with the, the way that I could solve this problem. But I couldn't, couldn't do it. And I remember saying to myself, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know, you know, it, 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 the, the pain that I was going through at that point in my life might not happen tomorrow. Maybe it will stop tomorrow. And it's a sort of argument that I couldn't, I couldn't refute. I, I couldn't do anything with that. Um, and that was kind of what kept me going for a long time. One day I was, uh, I was in my room. It was early hours of the morning. I was awake just trying to think things through in your head, you know, when you're, when you're depressed and you don't really do anything and you're, you don't really have, <laughs> you're isolated from everyone, you have a lot of time to think. So I would just sit there just thinking, how can I get out of this predicament? How can I solve this? How can I be happy? 
And I thought, well, when was the last time I actually was happy? When was the last time I felt like, I felt like I was genuinely happy where I was in life? And I thought about it and just a moment later I said, when I was in school, when I, when I was young, when I was a child, when I used to believe in God, it's, it gave me some sense of purpose in a, in a way, a very naive one, because it wasn't in any sense developed, but it was something. And I remember at that moment thinking, huh, that's something I haven't tried. So at that moment, I decided to pray to a God that I didn't believe in. I prayed to a God largely through pragmatic purposes because I needed something to intervene in my life and it wasn't me and it wouldn't be any of those around me. But at the same time, it was sincere because I genuinely hoped that this would be an answer. So I reached out, I prayed, and it was just something like, you know, I don't know if you're real, I don't know if you're really there, I don't know if this is just me having this figment in my own imagination, but if you are there, then I understand what that would mean. And what that would mean would be, I have done some things that I regret that are not only just like an abomination to me there, but they actually were against a holy and righteous God. If, if, if that was real, I knew the weight of what that would mean. And as I was praying this, I, I got a response and i never forget it. it. It was just the same three words repeated back. It was just, I love you. I love you. Just again and again. And it wasn't anything else. And I, I couldn't, I didn't know, man, I mean, <laughs> I, I just broke down. I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know how to ex express what I was feeling. I didn't know what, how to even describe what I was encountering or what this experience was. But I understood it was something meaningful and something that I couldn't turn away from. So from that moment on, I gave my life to, to Christ and I became a Christian. It wasn't easy becoming a Christian. I had some things I had to clear up. I think like two months prior to me becoming a Christian, I had entered into a relationship with a girl. Um, I was 17 years old at this point and we, we were basically friends with benefits and although we had a relationship, we had kind of left out that relationship and then we had sort of come together with this mutual understanding that we would, we, we would have sexual relations with each other. And I remember thinking like as, as someone who had just become a Christian, I needed to end this, like I couldn't go on living this way. Uh, and it was made more complicated by the fact that there was someone else that she thought she was in a relationship with. So it's definitely something that I, I wanted to, <laughs> that I had to get out of. And I, I had this plan, you know, we used to meet in the same place at the same times. And I thought, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there. And I used to plan it all out in my head. I would go there, I would say these things. She would either say this or she'd say this. And if she says this, then I'll say this. If she says this, I'll say this. And then I'll walk away and that'll be it. And that's how I'll deal with it. And so I would plan everything. And then, we, and then it came to actually meeting her and, and explaining this to her. And I sat her down and I said, look, we need to talk. I don't expect you to understand this, but I'm a Christian now. I, I, I've become a Christian. And she just looked at me like, <laughs> a, bit, a bit sort of like taken back. But of all the things that I thought she would say, of all the things that I had planned for on my list, you know, if she says this, I'll say this. If she says this, I'll say this. She said the one thing that I had, no, no response to, no plan for. I say, I'm a Christian now. And her response is, me too. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do about it. Um, her view was so different from mine. She was happy continuing that kind of relationship, just meeting up for sexual, sexual encounters, but <laughs> it never occurred to her that her professing to be a Christian would ever be an issue with that. And I was shocked by that. I, I, I was so shocked and taken back. I started to read very early on in my Christian journey. I was hugely into apologetics. I wanted to be able to defend my faith. Um, I wanted to be able to explain myself articulately to others and to give a reason for the hope that I have within me. So I was reading, I was reading, I was reading. In my Christian journey, there wasn't really anyone there who was a Christian. I didn't know any Christians 
it was I, I wasn't going to church um, I just wanted to study I wanted to practice sort of alone first before I could then get into a community but there was one person I knew and this was a person I'm gonna call it Jenny she she was a uh, someone who I was friends with at school, uh, college at this point, and she was a Jehovah's Witness. And I knew about Jehovah's Witnesses. I knew they weren't mainstream Christianity. I knew that many people called them a cult. I knew uh, about the practices with the refusal to um, have blood transfusions, uh, no tattoos. They thought that the cross was a, a stake. I understood these basic things. I didn't know about the doctrine of the rejection of, of Christ as Jesus as God. I didn't know that one. So every week she would give me the Awake magazine, the Watchtower magazine, and I had this huge stack of them because I, I collected them, right? And I was reading all of them. You know, as I was reading these, she was coming around with a friend who uh, um, was a, she was a pale redhead girl that I thought was quite cute at the time. Um, but she, so it was her and a friend that used to come around and we used to do Bible study, and I, I generally wanted uh, to learn because I had this zealousness for learning uh, at the time, like early on into, into becoming a Christian. She gave me a New World Translation Bible, which I didn't think anything of because I didn't know, didn't know about the issues of translation then. After finishing college, um, you know, try to stay in contact with Jenny, ended up going to university and I joined the Christian Union. I was convinced that I should continue practicing at my faith and to form a closer fellowship now that I had more of an opportunity to. So I joined the Christian Union and I was lucky enough to meet some people that kind of took me under their wing. They uh, gave me discipleship, particularly in philosophy. They were also interested in apologetics and I was grateful that I got an opportunity to, to study uh, with them. And one of the first things a good friend of mine did, he, he came up to me, you know, one of the first times he saw me, and he, he saw the, the Bible I had in my hand, and he, he said, what's that? I was like, oh, it's my Bible. And he looked at it, and you know, it's got like New World Translation written on it. He said, you know, my Bible is, um, it's like this super rare, <laughs> super rare Bible, right? Um, you know, there's only so many, there's like only so many of these printed in the world, it's like really, really, really good. But you know what, how about, since you're new here, we trade. And uh, I'll give you my amazing, awesome Bible. And you can just give me your, you know, your, your, old, your old one there. And, uh, I took it and we, we exchanged and he gave me, uh, I think it was just some normal like uh, revised standard version, I think it was. Uh, and I gave him my New World Translation and I think he sort of like picked it up and he just sort of like dropped <laughs> he, he, he disposed of it <laughs> as quickly as he could. But I started to learn um, more about Christian doctrine, I continued into apologetics, primarily against atheist and agnostic beliefs. There was no call of Islam on the table at this point. My relationships at home got better. I actually spent time talking to my siblings, to my parents try to make amends for the time that I had lost in adolescence. Not too long into being a Christian, uh, I discovered I had like heart issues. I think it's super, supraventricular tachycardia. is a sort of medical name. I used to suffer from these kind of like episodes where my heart would just beat super fast, like 230, 40, 50 beats a minute for many hours. And I remember once, uh, this, is, this is before I was diagnosed and before I went to hospital, I, I was just a kid. And I remember early hours in the morning, couldn't get to sleep, my heart was just beating so fast, and I felt so drained. One of the things that happens is you become exhausted because after hours and hours of such a high, fast heartbeat, you, you, you lose all energy. Um, you, but you can't sleep because your body won't let you sleep. And there was like a sofa, uh, and I was just lying on the sofa, and I was just hoping that I would just fall asleep, but I just wasn't. My body wasn't letting me. It becomes dangerous after after so many hours from the fact that your heart is just pumping that much blood around for that long. I didn't know this, but I, I was I was passing in and out of consciousness apparently. My mom woke up and decided to do some laundry, like in the early hours of the morning, or to, to put the the machine on the washing machine on or, or something. And she came downstairs and she just happened to see me there and she called an ambulance and. 
But for me, that's, that was a miracle in my life. There wasn't any reason that should have happened. Um, no reason someone should have woke up or, or dealt with me. I didn't have any strength to do, to help myself or to do anything. But for whatever reason, she woke up and she came and called me an ambulance and I was all right. Back in 2015, I think, I actually reached out to Jim and he just so happened to be driving through where I was working at the time. So he drove to, uh, to my apartment and I was on this like top floor of this apartment and uh, came and saw me and you know I opened the door. The first thing he did is he, he gave me a hug because you know, we hadn't seen each other for about six or seven years at that point. And you know, when we started to just, just talk and, and reminisce about the, the two different directions that our lives went because, you know, this guy had been such a, a pivotal part of my adolescence and growing up. You know, it was, it was me, him and, and some others and doing all the stuff we were doing. And uh, I broke away and he never did. He, he, he kept in that group and kept doing his thing. It was, it was surprising to me because he, he got a girl pregnant uh, at some point. He has a child with a woman whom they're not together. She, you know, they, they, they hate each other. They, they don't want to be in the same room as each other. There's now another guy in the child's life because she's moved on in another, another partnership, another relationship. And he absolutely hated him. You know, he, was, he, was, <laughs> he spent a good amount of his time telling me just how much he hated, hated this guy. Um, and the fact that, you know, he saw his kid more than he did. Um, and the thing about Jim was, you know, at the very least, I think he was, he was pretty honest. And uh, he was saying that, like, he got, like, child tax credit or whatever. He, he got some benefit. Um, but he spent a part of it on cocaine. He, uh, he was still doing that. And for, for whatever reason, you know, I, when he told me, I just sort of kept my mouth shut because I didn't know what to say to that. I didn't know. I just remember thinking that if I didn't, didn't change my own life, there are many mistakes that he's still making that I probably would have been making as well. But praise God, that, was, that wasn't what happened. Um, I changed the direction that I was going on and I became the man that I am today. I became Chris. I thank the Lord that he's blessed me with the life that I have today, the family that I, that I have, that I connect with, like I'm reconnected with, the friends, the people around me, the ministry. That's, that's my purpose. And uh, life is a lot better with a purpose. I couldn't give myself one, neither could my peers, neither could my family. But Christ is faithful, the Lord is faithful. And he gave me the provision that I needed to get out from where I was. And it took time, but here I am today. So, praise be to God. God bless you all. I hope you have a great day. I'll see you in the next one.